one and hello hello everybody so all right well so today we're going to talk about free willing hallucinations which is basically playing god with your own world simulation uh controlling its parameters but first uh the quilly of the day which uh you know i've kind of talked about several kinds of experiences in the several videos that i've made so far and uh Today we're going to talk about uh, a, a, an element, a very raw element, which is the element of surprise. And uh, I mean, for example, there's a kiwi right here that was in the back of my head and uh, that probably, uh, you know, created a bit of a spike in the energy parameter of your experience, a little bit of a, of a surprise, a, a tickle, so to speak. and. Uh, when you know i'll eat these later uh thank you for participating so well here's the thing um surprise is obviously extremely important you know it's important on so many levels it's important for understanding how we function as a self-organizing system and you know besides that of course when it comes to understanding psychedelic experiences exotic states of consciousness and even art even understanding art you really need to have a good model of surprise and the different kinds of surprises that there are. And, you know, at QRI, we take very seriously various lineages, such as the free energy principle and, you know, predictive coding, how, in a sense, you know, the things that don't, you know, abide by the implicit models that our nervous system have built about how we are behaving are the things that are brought up to our attention, are the things that, you know, are actually kind of surfaced in consciousness, so to speak, and uh, prioritized for us to, to pay attention to. In the world of the arts, one of the interesting things is that surprises, you can think of them as kind of generic, you know, energy amplifiers. You know, whatever, what, whatever stimuli is surprising, you know, you, you were not expecting, um, the quality of that stimuli becomes amplified. Now, you know, a lot of people think of like, well, surprises are negative, surprises are positive, and there's, there's a lot of confusion there. And uh, in our model, at the very least, how we are synthesizing all of these different lineages and contributing with the models of our own, basically surprises are, you know, energy amplifiers, meaning that if the stimulation, if the pattern of stimulation is consonant, and it's surprising, it's actually going to be high valence, uh, pretty positive, and vice versa, you know, very surprising, unexpected, dissonant stimuli <laughs> is particularly unpleasant. Likewise with other modalities, you know, even cognitive dissonance, you know, surprising cognitive dissonance and contradictions can be <laughs> surprisingly unpleasant. Now, um, one of the interesting things too is that, you know, surprise, um, has kind of a computational interpretation, uh, which, you know, is kind of like fleshed out in the free energy principle. And uh, we think that ultimately there's going to be a, a deep correspondence between kind of this computational notion of energy and an actual physical energy, uh, you know, potentially stored into connectome specific harmonic waves. Anyway, all of this is uh, a rabbit hole. If you're interested, I highly recommend you read uh, the essay that uh, was published in Art Against Art called Harmonic Society, where we go over basically all of these different models of art in, you know, a lot of detail. Um, but also we, we have a, a, you know, one presentation that I gave, you can find it in, in my YouTube channel as well, about, uh, yeah, precisely these, uh, these models of art, uh, basically applying kind of cutting edge cognitive science and figuring out how it works with, uh, with art and uh, how to produce very high valence experiences that way, very healing, ideally. Okay, so on to the topic of the day. Now, I will connect it with surprise um, right now, but also towards the end. You know, everything hopefully will make sense. Why Why that is the quilly of the day today. So, <laughs> but uh, free willing hallucinations are pretty surprising. So this is a phenomena. First of all, you know, I saw it really kind of described in detail in... Uh, this book called The Grand Illusion by Stephen Nehar. Stephen Nehar is a cognitive scientist. Uh, he has a wonderful website. You know, he has, it seems like he has like two life missions, which is A, spread the word of indirect realism about perception, <laughs> that actually we live in some kind of like, you know, bubble universe that is separate from, you know, the actual physical universe that is being rendered and generated inside your brain, even though you are 
for the most part, we are implicitly under the illusion that we can perceive the world directly. So that's one thing that Stephen Lehard has like some wonderful insights about. He has some wonderful diagrams that explain how that plays out um, and how it's so confusing, you know, why we actually feel that we're perceiving the, the environment directly. Um, related to, you know, Dan Hoffman. And, you know, if you're interested in that stuff, that's, you know, its own topic. But also Stephen Lehard talks about basically how you can understand a lot of phenomena in perception as the superposition of harmonic waves. Um, it sounds very woo as well, but this connects pretty deeply with um, holographic principles. Uh, basically how, uh, you know, in some sense, like a lot of the properties of your experience are holistic, uh, holistic properties, you know, you, which makes it, you know, redundant in, in a sense, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, resilient against degradation. It has kind of this graceful degradation, just uh, as a hologram. You know, you can damage a hologram here and there, but uh, it will not lose the, you know, overall picture. You know, there's these interesting trade-offs between, you know, encoding something in the frequency domain and in the spatial domain and how, like, yeah, you can have, like, a spatially robust image even though, you know, you're uh, messing up, you know, spatially with the way in which it's encoding. So there's a lot of fascinating things like that. And in the brain, uh, there's a lot of things that suggest something like that is going on when it comes to perception, that we are, you know, have an extremely resilient perception, especially, you know, with several types of uh, damage or, ma or malfunctions. And, you know, it's not exactly the case that you need the exact same neuron to fire every time in order to, you know, perceive a particular edge. It's more of a holistic phenomena, even though it has a lot of correlations with individual neurons. Anyway, this is also a rabbit hole. <laughs> I will definitely delve into it further in the future. But um, I, I basically wanted to say that, you know, okay, so like Stephen Lehar starts out with these, you know, various models of like, you know, the harmonic resonance theory of gestalt principles of experience, you know, these holistic holographic properties of consciousness. Again, not in a woo sense, in a, you know, in a very rigorous uh, sense. And I encourage you to read his, you know, his research. And then also indirect realism about perception. And um, one of the fascinating things is that in his book, The Grand Illusion, he details, you know, how he arrived at these various principles based on a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, psychoactive experiences of all sorts and also exotic experiences. Um, it's a short book. I highly, highly recommend reading it. It's super ent entertaining and honestly, some of the best trip reports you will see anywhere because, you know, he's writing as a, you know, as a retrospective after like many years of taking these substances and uh, more so he was taking, you know, LSD in high doses and exploring that while he was, you know, doing a PhD in cognitive science. And, you know, he had kind of this uh, critical feedback. He was able to talk to his, uh, you know, colleagues and, and friends while doing the PhD about his experiences. And that is the sort of, you know, constructive, intellectual, uh, rational environment where I think a lot of, you know, reinterpretations of these exotic phenomena happens. And, uh, you know, one of the fascinating things that he points out in there is that there was a special type of experience <laughs> that he experienced, which uh, he dubbed uh, free willing hallucination, which roughly speaking means that you're able to control the content of your experience at will. You know, he has this very funny talk. It's linked in the, in the description. <laughs> uh, this like, you know, weird conference, you know, for whatever reason they ask him, like, are the contents of experience epistemological, which is a very inscrutable question. And anyway, like very funny and strange question to ask, uh, honestly, but his response is hilarious. You know, he's like, you know, this, I don't know, 50, 60 year old guy, um, scientist, he looks very formal. And, you know, the way he responds to that question is, well, if you take the right combination of psychedelic drugs, <laughs> you can experience, uh, you can have the, the ability to imagine and recreate a table in your consciousness with eyes closed that looks every bit as real as a quote-unquote real table and you can see it from every angle you want and you can decorate it and add color to it and shape and so on like wow okay like that that's an interesting video now the book goes into much more detail about how this actually you know happened and uh, i'm just gonna kind of like share a little bit about like you know the the recipe for this and like the first time that this appears in his book uh it's a uh, in, in the form of a DXM, in particular, you know, substantial doses of DXM, probably about like 500 milligrams or something in that range, 
not too much that you're so dissociated that you can't, you know, uh, you, you don't remember who you are or anything like that. But also, like, not mild enough that, like, this phenomenon doesn't happen. There's kind of a sweet spot. And on top of that, THC, basically weed edibles. And uh, I, I don't know the dose, probably 10 milligrams. Uh, I'll have to ask him next time I, I talk to him. But uh, basically, with, uh, with that combination, uh, something happens that you end up in this world of experience where kind of the patterns of vibration and the attention field lines and basically the the dynamics of awareness are kind of calibrated just right such that out of sheer will you can entrain little shapes in your experience and they remain there for you to play with so it's kind of this playground you know it's a I mean, it's kind of like an alien, you know, hyperdimensional playground, but it is a playground of imagination, but, you know, photorealistic. It's not, you know, you could even say something like, well, uh, a, somebody who is aphantasic, somebody who has aphantasia, who doesn't have any pictures in their heads whenever you, you know, you, you try to evoke an image to a person who's like, quote unquote, neurotypical, or maybe somebody who has a strong visualization ability, who can imagine like, you know, pictures pretty well, you know, that difference is much smaller than the difference between, you know, a normal person or a person who's good at visualizing and a person who's experiencing a free willing hallucination. Like a free willing hallucination is like very real, is like very solid. And I'm sure that if you don't have as a background philosophic, philosophical assumption, the idea that you exist in a world simulation in, inside your brain, it feels like you, quote unquote, hacked the matrix and now you're kind of accessing the code of the universe and you're playing with it. And, you know, and of course, that itself is a rendering of reality. As uh, I was talking in a previous video, one of the fascinating things about DMT and other psychedelics, especially DMT, is that it plays a lot with your model of what the game of reality is about. You know, it's not only like, you know, colors and pictures and shapes and, you know, tactile sensations. It's also what is the big picture? What is this all about? You know, are we God? Are we, you know, emptiness? Are we <laughs> in a computer simulation? You know, all of that type of kind of like high level philosophical reasoning is also a parameter of your world simulation. So in a free willing hallucination, if you kind of like constrain those parameters and you, you know, have like a physicalist, the world simulation is, you know, indirect realist perspective, then you can play with the colors and the shapes and, you know, stabilize that. Uh, if, you're, if you're not aware, you know, that that's what's kind of like going on, you will probably end up in this weird exploration of the state space that includes being super confused about the nature of reality as well. <laughs> so that's something to, to keep in mind, you know, if you, if you replicate this, uh, this, uh, this experience. Now, uh, it might be kind of dangerous, potentially. I mean, I don't know, especially when it comes to like, you know, uh, your heart and uh, blood pressure. Like, I don't know, DXM and weed combined does seem kind of a, probably like straining the system. Although, I don't know, being very pragmatic, if you are really serious about, you know, replicating psychonautic states, <laughs> probably adding a little bit of, a, I don't know, a relaxing agent on top of that. Like, I don't know, just suggesting you know, gabapentin, something in that space, <laughs> the sort of thing that you should never take every day because the withdrawal is awful. In the right circumstances, maybe in combination with psychedelics, it can actually make the experience far more useful, far more like, you know, not so much anxiety distracting you from exploring the, the phenomena of interest. Now, uh, that's kind of like a rough and ready way of getting a free willing hallucination later on in the book um he described a, a better recipe that works even better and this i have received a number of like reports from like yeah pretty smart psychonauts uh you know i, I wouldn't even describe them as like full-time psychonauts or anything like that you know like <laughs> mit phd in math you know with a software engineering job but who takes drugs in the weekend every once in a while but he's like a you know really rational psychonaut that type of demographic is from which I, I get a lot of uh, trip reports. And uh, that's kind of a, a fascinating community, uh, you know, kind of like intellectual lineage to, to build on top of, especially because they are then aware as well of these other intellectual lineages, like, you know, the free energy principle, predictive coding and uh, things like that. Uh, anyway, so from this type of uh, demographic, I, I have received, you know, confirmations that the combination of LSD, 
let's say like 100 to 200 micrograms, you know, that range together with like ketamine, roughly 50 to 100 milligrams together with a little bit of THC, maybe 5, 10 milligrams generates very reliably what ends up being a free willing hallucination. Now, I should definitely mention that, you know, free willing hallucinations, you know, they're almost certainly a, a huge family. You know, it's not like, oh, dang, you're in a free willing hallucination. Like now different rules apply. Like, no, well, there's kind of a continuum, you know, in some states of consciousness, you can control maybe the emotional tone of the experience. Maybe in, a, in other states of consciousness, you can control the, the projective layout of the experience. That's an important parameter. Maybe in other states, you can control the, you know, philosophizing high level, you know, conceptualization. Um, but, uh, you know, the LSD plus ketamine plus THC precisely dosed and, and timed. I guess the, the timing as well, I should mention. The re reports were like something like waiting three hours after the LSD and then taking the ketamine, like two or three hours, the ketamine and the THC after one hour, something like that. Uh, so that when you take the ketamine, you're experiencing the synergy between the LSD and the THC. Anyway, just... <laughs> just putting the details out there. So um, that type of experience does have apparently a broad spectrum of control in that you can control the shape, the color, the texture, the orientation, uh, the you know density, like how many things are happening. And even, and this is one of the craziest things, you can also control agenthood. You know, on, on DMT, usually it's very hard to control. It's very crazy. You get these like entities and like, you know, sub agent chaotic sub agent generation um and these free willing hallucinations on the other hand is like it's kind of an experienced editor is like all right let me create you know a girlfriend or boyfriend or i don't know like a family <laughs> let me create a my custom mantis you know dmt alien and uh even though you're you know an lsd and academy like you know whatever like you you can create these elaborate bizarre you know entities with the qualia of the other, you know, the otherness. And you can amplify the qualia of the feeling that it's an other. It's one of the things as well that, like, to a large extent, once you experience this sort of thing, it, it can kind of convince you that, oh, okay, okay, the DMT entities weren't actually from another dimension. They were just, like, super highly overly expressing these, like, intense qualia of the other. And uh, well, if you can control it and it's kind of like, kind of like a dial that you can you can play play with, uh, then yeah, you know it's a different it's a different game altogether. Um, and yeah, you realize, oh gosh, you know the the world simulation goes very deep, as uh, <laughs> as you might think uh, from the Matrix. You know the rabbit hole goes pretty deep. Um, and in in some sense, this is kind of like taking the red pill in the Matrix, except that rather than quote unquote realizing that you live in a excuse me in a uh, computer simulation, you exist in a neuronal simulation by your brain. And for a lot of people, this is extraordinarily surprising. Now, I guess among a lot of people who I interact with, um, they tend to realize this pretty early on in their life. Um, I, I was aware of these like around like the age of 10, kind of like realizing, oh yeah, actually all of this is happening <laughs> inside a simulation inside of my my brain uh for a number of reasons i think one of the the hints actually was uh looking at a at a pencil in a in in a glass of water and just seeing how it bent and like okay clearly the pencil is not bending you know the bending is happening you know in the way the light is arranged and that kind of suggested like oh yeah actually it's bending quote unquote in my world simulation um the term itself you know kind of a, a world simulation is something that uh, i've got from uh, david pierce who also talks a lot about how <laughs> yeah i mean how like you can explain a lot of crazy behavior from other people in terms of them just living in a different universe really i mean like in a different in a, in a world simulation with very different parameters and phenomenal texture likewise uh where you're if you're on mdma or something like that and you feel you know you love the world and the world loves you and that's an inherent intrinsic quality of existence yeah, I would say, you know, that you're shifting the one of these like high level parameters of your world simulation, kind of these high level priors about like, you know, the friendliness of the universe and uh, and the hedonic tone, the the average hedonic tone. So anyway, the 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 rabbit hole goes very deep when you start examining world simulationism, uh, not the matrix type, 
for the neuronal soil type. Um, I should mention, you know, it is a spectrum. And uh, one of the, the things that, uh, of course, like, uh, not of course, but like one of the other fascinating ways in which you can get like some aspects of uh, free willing hallucinations is with this uh, technique called a uh, fire casino. And uh, I'm also adding in the description uh, a wonderful, wonderful meditation report, subjective report by uh, Daniel Ingram, uh, which is a uh, yeah, pretty, pretty awesome, like Dharma teacher and like meditation master who uh, basically describes what it's like for him. You know, he's already pretty ad super advanced and like, you know, spent so many hours meditating, but like, he, he basically goes into these retreats where, like, for two weeks, he spends, uh, you know, 12, 13, 14 hours a day meditating. In the, in the in this case, he's, like, looking at a, at a fire. Uh, and then, like, until, you know, it kind of, like, quote-unquote, burns your retina, you know, you create this very strong after image. Uh, and then uh, uh, you close your eyes, and then you focus on that after image, and you try to brighten it. Uh, well, you, you can do several things, but one of the things is, like, you try to keep it alive. For as much for as long as possible and uh after you do this for many many hours uh you know over and over and over again you start actually having very strange super psychedelic uh experiences but with one of the de defining features of them is that they have a, a very high level of control you know it, it, he talks about like creating a dragon that then breathes fire and then the fire um touches him and it's kind of this multimodal hallucination and if you're in a multimodal cross modally coherent hallucination it means you're probably in the fourth jana and there's like interesting things like that but uh in, the thing that he highlighted that i found fascinating and, and the reason why i'm wearing this shirt today <laughs> which by the way i got a, a tucson in 2016 when i went with david pierce uh to the science of consciousness uh conference you can see is a tucson i don't know i really like this shirt it's very quailia rich and in that sense uh, it fits my my aesthetic and uh the trip report meditation report that daniel uh has in uh has written it's uh about color control and he basically talks about being in this very very enhanced hyper energetic state of consciousness where colors had an incredible emotional depth you know incredible valence and they were incredibly intense and he could play with them. He could create any picture, any combination of color he wanted. And one of the things that he tried was, uh, you know, putting one color, one shade of one color in, in half of his visual field and a slightly different shade in the other half of his visual field. And then kind of try, trying to match them and see at what point do they blend into the same shape and a lot of really cool things like that. And he says like he had a absurdly insanely fun time playing with that which uh yeah is one of the reasons i uh look forward to doing a fire casino hopefully this year <laughs> and i will definitely <laughs> write about it you know no matter what happens but uh anyway that seems to be a, a non-drug based uh recipe for at least a component of free willing hallucinations so now uh this is really just the beginning right like in the future, we will perhaps even have kind of a experience editor where you can not, not only kind of like in this haphazard way, kind of like recreating aspects of your experience and, you know, but actually being able to take snapshots of it and, and recreate it and then like do, you know, projective transformations and, uh, and bringing elements that you created before and then like making Qualia experiments in order to see like how you know, qualia chemistry, turning like, you know, the alchemy of psychedelics into an actual chemistry of consciousness. Yeah, I, I, that's what I envision Super Shulgin Academies generating in the future, basically reliable methods of all sorts, combining meditation and transcranial magnetic stimulation and perhaps even genetic engineering in order to obtain this extremely high level of control over our qualia. So you can, you know, create this experience, you know, this dynamic experience, kind of like a movie where, you know, all sorts of things happen reliably. And it's like, oh, let's add a little bit of a ketamine qualia over here, a little bit of, you know, hyper dopaminergic. Oh, let's animate this uh, sub-agent. Oh, this sub-agent seems uh, a little bit uh, unstable. Let's uh, lower its, uh, you know, dopamine function and things like that. You know, that's uh, that's the future. That's the future that I envision. And that's like probably just in the next couple hundred years, like the sort of things that we will see <laughs> 
in terms of consciousness technologies, you know, thousands or millions of years from now, of course, there's no way to conceive them. But yeah, just completely out there, uh, I, I expect, and probably hyper ultra blissful. Uh, I, I'd expect that as well. I guess uh, I, I did also want to make kind of like mention a, a shout out to uh, because I consider, you know, Stephen Lehar and Daniel Ingram as like really excellent phenomenologists, you know, people who are actually really good at describing the phenomenal character of all of these states of consciousness and saying meaningful, non-trivial things about them without getting confused or getting too wrapped up into the whole memeplex that we're all God or too wrapped up into like some new age memeplex. It's like, no, 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 they're just like actually focused on the nat nature and quality of their experience without, you know, necessarily pushing a metaphysical interpretation on it. And uh, that's fantastic. That's super useful information, quite frankly. So a bit of a shout out, which is like other people like that. Uh, I, I really respect uh, James Kent, uh, who wrote uh, Psychedelic Information Theory, also in the uh, in the in the description of the video. Uh, now, he doesn't talk about free willing hallucinations, but he gets pretty close. Uh, and uh, he also has like some recipes that produce maybe overwhelming experiences rather than particularly good experiences. <laughs> I mean, I'm not even going to mention them because uh, I don't want to encourage people to try them because they're probably just really unpleasant. But uh, anyway, it's, you know, actually a really good psychonaut, I would say, and uh, very smart, very rational. And uh, I guess like a new kid in the block, uh, like junk bond trader, if, you, if you're there, like, uh, hi. <laughs> I, I know he commented in one of my videos recently, but uh, he, uh, he, yeah, he started a YouTube channel recently and... Uh, Honestly, his uh, trip reports of DMT and LSD, 2CB and 4ACO DMT, uh, what else, uh, mushrooms, uh, really some of the best uh, descriptions that I have, uh, have encountered, even though it's like, you know, this random YouTube video from somebody who uh, doesn't, I don't know, I don't know his academic credentials, but like, you know, it doesn't matter. His phenomenology is like top notch. And I, I, I definitely want to encourage more people to kind of follow that tradition of uh, just very clearly articulate, you know, every surprising element of a strange experience so that we can create a vocabulary for all of these. Uh, I guess uh, a couple more things about free willing hallucinations, which is um, there's this entire notion of like, okay, what is the information content of an experience? And something that, you know, at QRI we have considered for quite a while as perhaps like the gold standard of why what a, you know, a zero information state of consciousness might be would be kind of a, a peak uh, 5-MeO DMT state where the space and, and phenomenal space and time are completely smooth. Um, there's no multiplication of subagents. It's not a chaotic process. It's a perfectly repeating infinite lattice. It's not infinite. <laughs> you can create the illusion of infinity when you have two parallel mirrors, something like that. You know, it might actually be a, a, a finite space but topologically set up in such a way that, you know, attention field lines never interfere with each other. So you create this powerful illusion of infinity. I mean, it's uh, kind of the projective points don't meet at, don't meet at infinity. They keep going. And uh, that for sure confuses the, the heck out of you. You know, it, it makes you feel that <laughs> makes you feel that you were into an infinite dimension. Again, maybe you went into a infinite reflection mirror dimension which still has finite space that feels infinite now something that will absolutely grant anybody who who talks about like oh that infinity was very profound is that the valence of that experience is you know insane you know it's like the most blissful light and space and the creaminess it's kind of like being kissed by by god so to speak it's just perfect you know perfect states of consciousness and in that sense, they may become kind of the gold standard for, you know, a zero information state of consciousness. And in that sense, you may be able to tell, you know, using metaphors from computer science and information theory, you may be able to tell the quote unquote Kolmogor of complexity or the KL divergence. Uh, you can look this up. But basically, ways of telling how much information there is in an experience as a function of the edit distance from the 5-MeO DMT state, you know, and this actually is kind of a way of formalizing a lot of these spiritual tropes where, you know, you you take LSD or whatever, you become God, you realize that you're God, this infinite, you know, pure, you know, 
unconditioned light, which, yeah, it's a state of consciousness, very valuable. And then as you come down, it kind of like you descend into like more specifics and more specifics until you're kind of in planet Earth and then you're like an animal and then you're a human and then you're a particular human and then a human in your particular context and then it's you. Yeah, you know, that's kind of like you had this pure, you know, boundless, you know, symmetrical state of consciousness and you're adding symmetrical breaking symmetry breaking operations to it slowly until it crumbles up in exactly in the right shape that constitutes who or what you are you know so in that sense you know if we create kind of an experience editor you can in, in, in some sense like quantify the distance between any two experiences in terms of i mean roughly what is the shortest path which because of the hyperbolic nature of state spaces like that for the most part is going to typically be very close to like you know becoming quote unquote god becoming this pure consciousness zero information and then doing a kind of a kind of a turn and then moving towards the other experience um that's just because you know in hyperbolic space yeah oftentimes like the shortest path is, path is through the center so like yeah i expect you know <laughs> for a lot of experiences you know the shortest path between you know us and those experiences are going to be through the pure consciousness state not for all of them, you know, from one moment to the next, the edit distance might not be that large. You know, you can probably, um, yeah, recreate, a, you know, the experience you're having right now with uh, slight alterations relative to the experience you were having 10, ten seconds ago. Um, okay, so that's, a, you know, information content. I expect, like, you know, information theory is about message passing. Tononi and his information, integrated information theory is finally about kind of intrinsic information in states. I think there's going to be completely new revolution on information theory, but it's going to be about basically the information of consciousness, of different states of consciousness. And it's going to be a super interesting, highly technical field. Right now, it sounds like this is all hippie, new age, whatever. It's like, no, there's going to be some super hardcore equations. <laughs> and more so because for the most part, you know, information can be physicalized yeah, that's also going to be ultimately connected with the fundamental attractors in the fields of reality. So anyway, I'm just hinting at this. Maybe this is not even going to happen before before I die. But uh, <laughs> hey, 23rd century uh, YouTube watchers, uh, I, I told you. I told you that was going to happen. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, the, the last few things for uh, free will and hallucinations is that uh, yeah, this dopaminergic drive, kind of, uh, you can animate agents uh, on, on a free willing hallucination. It's not just like objects. Uh, Stephen Lehar also, like, for example, talks about like, you know, creating a plane and then like jumping into the plane and then like flying it and like uh, participating in like some battle in the air or whatnot. And like he, he, he used to fly planes in, in real life. Uh, so he could actually tell the difference between his hallucinated, you know, reconstructed plane relative to like the actual plane and, and there were some differences and, and and it had to do with the information content of, of his experience like the the dashboard uh in the plane in his hallucinated plane had fewer buttons for example there were just like fewer details to it and it, it wasn't completely functional so at least with the recipe that he was trying there are like some maybe uh, you know like upper bounds to the detail to the kolmogorov of complexity of the experience that you can generate but, you know, that might be something that we can overcome with uh, the te techniques that we discover in, in the future. Um, and I think, like, yeah, finally, Quilia Critters. Uh, it's uh, something that I've uh, mentioned here and there. A um, couple of weird articles that I wrote about uh, that touched upon Quilia Critters. But, um, you know, DMT entities are kind of like these elaborate, you know, high level, you know, it's kind of like your sister or like, you know, your the principal of the school you know it's kind of this very rich phenomenology but compare that with like how you model an ant you know like a relatively little agent you can still kind of model it as having some kind of free will and i'll explain that in a second but yeah basically uh it's making decisions and it has like drives and it has like needs and it's trying to meet all of those with some kind of minimax you know optimization process and it turns out on a free willing hallucination, you can create lots of those, right? So like you can create like, you know, tens or hundreds of little quilly creators with like their independent, you know, agent programs, or you can create a few large, 
you know, entities, or you can create kind of this power law of like a lot of critters and then some in the middle and then some large ones and then maybe God as well, because, <laughs> you know, you've always got to bring, bring God into the picture. Well, it's it can be fun. It can be fun to bring God uh, into the picture if you can simulate God. As an aside, you know, one of the properties of kind of like phenomenal God in uh, in these states, it's uh, kind of a, a point of view from nowhere, that like it's a part of the state of consciousness that knows everything about everything in that state of consciousness. Whereas one of the fascinating things about the, the sub-agents that you can generate is that they also have kind of a independent buckets for where they, how much information they contain and what kind of information they contain. So like if you're very paranoid on an LSD trip, for example, I think like you're mixing kind of uh, an enhanced capacity for generating kind of rich agents with partial information together with a ansiogenic state so basically it ends up being, you know, they are kind of like battling each other or like they're afraid of each other. And yeah, you can be very paranoid, you know, simul over simulate, you know, kind of uh, expect more theory of mind from like a police officer or something like that, you know, or government conspiracies or, you know, whatever, like rich kind of compartmentalization of the epistemology of the agents. Yeah, that's also a property of a... Uh, a one's world simulation, something you can play with. And God, <laughs> God in your world simulation is one of those agents that has complete information access to what's going on with every agent. And that's why also in some sense, you know, you are God in those experiences, not only because of open individualism, but because you as the controller of the experience, you have full knowledge of what's going on in that space. Now, and I guess, yeah, this is uh, this is about as much as I wanted to say about uh, free willing hallucinations, but it connects with uh, the Kiwi. Kiwi again, uh, New Zealand. So, um, you know, being a Kiwi, well, no, okay, backtrack. What, what I want to say is free will. You know, if you have a free willing hallucination, where you quote unquote know everything, you're in contact with the phenomenal God of that space. Uh, is that not going to be boring? Like, is not like, aren't you going to get bored? And so I would say, you know, not necessarily. Actually, that's kind of just a not a particularly, you know, good, you know, way of tackling the question of like whether we should even make these things you know because you could learn a lot about consciousness even if it was boring so okay like that's one thing but then also boredom is highly connected with like low valence so if you're in an ecstatic free willing hallucination even if you know everything in it you're not going to get bored in the sense you know the meaning of the word boredom refers to a particular set of qualia and that tends to have a negative valence. So in that sense, yeah, the very meaning of boredom may go out the window if you're in an ecstatic, high hedonic tone, you know, trippy, <laughs> free willing hallucination. But I, I, I would I would like to say that like, okay, even if we deeply care, we're, we're not going to do anything that will get us bored and we need novelty and we have kind of this obsession with new information because, you know, maybe new information is intrinsically valuable or whatever. Okay, sure. Let's take that position for a moment. Um, are free willing hallucinations still something good or fun to do? Well, you may know everything in the moment, but you don't know a what you will be doing in the future. You don't you don't know what you are about to do. And in that sense, it, it, it doesn't get boring. You don't know yourself enough to know what you're going to do, and you are the god of that space. And in that sense, yeah. I mean, it's kind of this paradox of like, does no, God, like if no, if God can do everything such as like doing radically unpredictable, unpredictable things and God knows everything, you know, can he know what he's going to do? And in the case of a, you know, free willing hallucination, the answer is like, yeah, you don't. I mean, you, you really don't know. You, you may change your mind uh, and do something else. And, uh, and, and more so, you can evolve that state of consciousness especially in into finding chaotic attractors. So a lot of combinations of qualia, you know, some scenes, if you simulate, you know, particular spaces, there might not be a lot of interactions between the different elements in the scene. It's kind of like, you know, mixing various objects together. 
I don't know. Like putting all of these things, you know, close to each other, like no interesting reaction is going to happen. Uh, you're just kind of displacing physical situation, but <laughs> that's about it. Whereas, you know, if you're mixing, you know, acids and bases and, you know, biological entities and, you know, all sorts of other things. Yeah, a lot of really surprising reactions and interactions that are going to happen. Likewise, with qualia space, there are, you know, varieties of qualia that are very reactive with each other and uh, special like feelings of space and pressure that yeah can create like really chaotic things and uh, in that sense there's kind of these like dual aspect to like you don't know what's going to happen a you don't know what you're yourself are going to do or think or feel and b the scene the quote-unquote world simulation externalized um can have unpredictable unfolding you know chaotic qualia events and in that sense allow you to explore the state space of consciousness and continue to be surprised by it. And I actually expect it to be a very long journey, you know, maybe even millions of years, as David Pierce would, would suggest. Now, um, I do want to touch about, like, free will, which is uh, what I'll conclude with, which is uh, uh, my collaborator, colleague, uh, uh, good friend, Mike, Mike Johnson, you know, he has these... Uh, Principia Qualia, which you can access online, uh, fully free. Um, I believe you can even order like one, a physical copy uh, off of Amazon. And um, one of the fascinating things that he has in here is basically kind of uh, postulating what kind of thing free will might refer to. And here we're talking about the, the qualia of, of free will. So he's speculating on the kind of like necessary conditions for free will, which are... A, you need to be a complex, chaotic, coalition-based dynamic system with well-defined attractors and a high level of criticality. And that means low act activation energy model uh, needed to switch between attractors. So like when you're in a critical state, that refers to, for example, when a, a mountain is being, uh, you know, drowned with a lot of snow. So there's like all kinds of like cascades, uh, you know, uh, happening all across its ranges and uh, if you plot that it follows a power law but the point is like you touch anywhere in that mountain it has so much surplus of snow that a, you know a cascade is going to happen so when you're in a critical state in a self-organizing criticality uh, uh, you know configuration of your of your nervous system which happens on psychedelics for the most part usually as well um, but more so on psychedelics you need very little effort to cause big changes in your world simulation in you know in that sense uh uh you could say a high level of criticality but also in a you know emotionally aroused the states that also happens um it doesn't happen for example if you're experiencing like depersonalization or derealization or um deep depression you know in those cases um yeah you need a lot of energy to do any kind of change so you could even say a highly depressed person doesn't have free will <laughs> in some sense in some sense, you know, morally, maybe we should, uh, you know, treat them, of course, as having free will, but uh, uh, in kind of like this field picture view, maybe not. Uh, and finally, having an internal model of self as agent that cannot predict itself. And um, yeah, you know, this whole idea that we are kind of this coalition based system, you know, we have a lot of emotional and, you know, physical needs and and they're competing against each other and screaming at each other so that they, they draw kind of the attention of the entire system. And uh, yeah, so there's uh, something really crazy about that. And uh, when you're creating a world simulation and you're creating these like Quilia creators, you are creating these actually super, you know, chaotic, high criticality, coalition based system with a um, kind of like agent uh, self as a model and that cannot predict itself. So that is to say, free willing hallucinations are not going to get boring anytime soon. <laughs> you, can, you can trust me on that one. And they all, yeah, they're almost certainly far more entertaining than, you know, even the most entertaining show or game you could possibly, you could possibly play. The, the realm of the mind is extremely large and just vastly under is explored um i guess coming back to junk bond trader he in one of his dmt uh reports i think like dmt com combined with a bunch of other things 
I think, yeah. I think it was like 2CB LSD mushrooms DMT space. But, but hey, believe me, he's like still clearly able to describe this in a cogent way. Um, yeah, he talks about like kind of like going through these holes where he could choose any hole and like choose any story and any configuration and anything he, he wanted, he could make it happen. Yeah, that state is real. You can access it in the right circumstances. Hopefully we find non-invasive, you know, maybe even not, not even non-drug ways of doing it, you know, a regeneralized fire casino, but for, you know, every aspect of, of experience. Um, and, uh, and as a final comment, uh, I want to recommend a, a really fun and uh, a pretty, you know, cute, but also, you know, mind expanding essay by uh, Andrew Zuckerman uh, about super free will, which is, hey, if you were to extend, you know, the, the, the properties that, uh, give rise to the phenomenology and, you know, the computational properties of, of free will. Um, yeah, you could in principle acquire super free will. And maybe, you know, from the point of view of a super super free will agent that has like so many displayed options at, at its service with kind of the potent, you know, it's not only like, oh, I have like these 17 possible careers I could do, but it's also like, oh, and I'm, I'm super ultra motivated to do any one of them. So it's not, you know, Basically, something like that, like hyper motivated, super ultra breadth of options and also uh, kind of like big depth of exploration. Yeah, that could be super free will. So that's also in store in the future. Um, so, yeah, because right now I think our free will is pretty, pretty deficient. We don't really have that many, that many options. Um, uh, I feel like concluding with uh, something random to show to myself and others that I have free will, but all right, so a little bit of a tea. This is definitely where the video becomes very trippy because there's just no plan. I mean, I thought I was going to turn it off, but then all of a sudden I realized that I can also just not turn it off. Yeah, they have chamomile tea. One of the interesting things about chamomile apparently is that uh, it does have like some really powerful sedatives with an extremely long half-life, <laughs> but uh, you need to isolate them. But apparently, you know, they are very powerful and they can give you benzo-like withdrawal if you take them in high doses for a long period of time. So chamomile tea <laughs> can actually screw you up really badly. Uh, and uh, I'm going to exercise my free will to conclude with a story, which is that, uh, yeah, my mom says everything, according to science, everything will kill you. I mean, she cares about probabilities still, but she jokes about the fact that anything that we think is totally safe is like, you know, the other day is like, oh, it turns out like licorice, you know, these like, you know, universally <laughs> consumed candy in, in Iceland and other parts of the world as well, you know, causes birth defects and reduces the IQ of your, of your baby if you eat it during pregnancy. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it turns out licorice is terrible, you know, according to science. Well, chamomile tea, you know, she, she used to joke like, well, someday they're going to figure out that chamomile causes cancer. And like, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to tell you, tell you, I told you so. And uh, I was reading the other day and apparently coumarin is one of the ingredients of, uh, of chamomile, which is, uh, uh, produces cancer as it turns out, uh, in high doses and maybe, uh, in some of your organs, maybe it doesn't have enough, but, and also, you know, so many, so many perfumes, uh, have like coumarin in them like but in tiny doses and that's also why i don't put it in my uh skin i put it in my my t-shirt um i'm noticing too now that by telling the story my free will has kind of a gone a little bit down because these are thoughts that i have already uh, already thought of um but uh yeah uh so back to free will all right let's end this goodbye thanks